Thinking of picking up Darksiders 3 now that it's almost been out a week? Upon release, it received less than exceptional praise. That may be why you're here, so let's dive in to Should You Bind 5 Darksiders 3. Darksiders 3 seeks to elaborate the details of the apocalypse laid forth in the two predecessor games, Darksiders 1 and 2, by installing the third on-screen horseman of the apocalypse, Fury, to fulfill the esoteric wishes of the geologically bound, quasi-spiritual force of the Council. Got it. Makes tons of sense. Fury is tasked on capturing the recently re-released Seven Deadly Sins, who now roam the desolate world, ruling in ruination, until greeting Fury's scorned whip or her scorned chains, or her scorned hammer, or scorned edge. Fury is scorned. Got it. Within moments of beginning our narrative, Fury's plot motivation is revealed. Her horse, Rampage, is mysteriously killed, which sends her into a murderous tantrum until there's roughly two hours left in the game. Apocalyptic tantrum. Darksiders 3 is easily one of the most linear games of 2018, and I don't strictly mean the environment. Reminiscent of the original Darksiders, the environment in Darksiders 3 is teeming with mystery and secret pathways, which is one of the truest elements in the iteration to the core franchise and one of its major saving graces. Otherwise, Darksiders 3 is the most disoriented title, plagued by amnesia about its identity as a sequel in a franchise and at war with its inability to distinguish itself from the myriad of hack and slash titles that have come before it. Darksiders 3 major departure from the core franchise is its combat. In previous iterations, Darksiders functioned like a more or less complicated God of War clone. Death and War would face off against waves of angels and demons alike, violently dispensing their brand of justice in a flurry of sequenced button spamming. However, following in the trend of many third-person hack-and-slash titles in the modern generation, Darksiders 3 has adapted the Dark Souls-style combat system, drastically slowing down the game and the pace in an attempt to offer a more focused and refined combat scheme. This is at least what they attempted. The mess of a camera system both in combat and basic traversal, coupled with lackluster weapon options and rinse and repeat attack patterns, Darksiders 3 Combat is a mechanical mess, empty of what makes its inspiration as well as its predecessors great. Not only is the button map locked, but the attack schemes are the same for every single weapon. There are a few ways to combine the game's special magic powers known as hollow abilities with each other, and there are a few unique combos that ultimately leave the player finding the most powerful combo and rarely deviating, at least in my experience. Darksiders 3 seeks to combine elements of a soul-style combat game, but removes all the elements that make it work by offering virtually no weapon and playstyle diversity, while ultimately injecting it and packaging it in something that feels like it was developed in 2004. The lack of distinguishable weaponry, fighting moves, discernible upgrades, and abilities makes the new combat feel ancient. I'm failing to mention many of the shortcomings in our short time. Playing Darksiders 3 is a linear mess in so many ways. Fury is one of the flattest lead characters I have ever played in gaming. Her narrative arc is totally forced, uninspired, and uses cheap emotional gimmicks as an illusory substitute for substantial writing and character motivation. Darksiders 3 has two novel surprises both in story and in gameplay, which don't make themselves present until you've completed at least 90% of the game. I won't provide any spoilers, but the twists and turns of this title were obvious and provide no depth to the experience. Similar to the original God of War trilogy, Fury's lack of depth is substantiated through somewhat prolific and enticing antagonist characters in the form of the Seven Deadly Sins. Not only did the Sins each have a very elaborate character model, their individual perspectives of the apocalypse were unique and emblematic of the Sin they represented. These characters provided one of the few heartbeats in a game that definitely arrived dead. In terms of visuals, Darksiders 4 really isn't that bad to look at. It looks pretty cool from the awesome light shows available by the different hollow powers, to unique light sources, particle effects, and an interesting hybrid of low-polygon, high-texture mapping that grants the player an experience that reminds you of a high-quality Ratchet & Clank game. Certain textures and lighting seem really well done, while others, like Fury's base hair, are polygonal and lack depth. The NPCs are unique and well done, which provides a change of pace to the ridiculously stale environment. Since the game doesn't have a map, you'd expect sprawling environments loaded with iconography and recognizable landmarks to help traverse, but instead, each environment is visually unique upon entering, but quickly becomes clones of itself. Couple all of this with a myriad of bugs and glitches and crashes that cause content losing checkpoints, you have the formulaic disaster Darksiders I don't have time to get into the nitty gritty, but wait until this game costs near nothing if you want to pick it up. It will probably plummet in price soon. It's fun for the last two hours, but you'll have to trudge through 10 to 12 hours of mucky gameplay to get to the fun. But you ultimately find this game to be more of a chore than an escape.